Ich darf vielleicht gleich noch mal auf den Namen dieses Buches zurückkommen, der mich auch so ein bisschen hierher geführt hat. Vielleicht auch noch vorweg, wir sind beide sehr inspontan, deswegen haben wir beide unsere Paper und werden relativ viel ablesen. Genau. Ich freue mich eigentlich total, den Abend heute moderieren zu dürfen und dem sozusagen vielleicht eine kleine Einleitung vorwegzuschicken zu Melinda Cooper, weil es im Grunde genommen auch eine Art Fortsetzung eines mittlerweile doch etwas längeren theoretischen Dialogs halt geworden ist, der darauf beruht oder sozusagen seinen Ausdruck auch darin gefunden hat, dass wir eben dieses Büchlein herausgegeben haben, übrigens mit dem Titel Sie nennen es Leben, wir nennen es Arbeit. Und ich, Melinda Cooper wird übrigens heute Abend nicht, wie gestern angekündigt, unsere nicht reproduktive Zukunft vortragen, sondern wird heute Abend zentrale Thesen aus ihrem aktuellen Buch Family Values präsentieren, in dem es um die ökonomische und die ideologische Bedeutung von Familie im Neoliberalismus und ihre Entstehungsbedingungen geht. Zuvor möchte ich aber tatsächlich so ein bisschen so einen Kontext ihrer bisherigen Forschungen und Bücher und Analysen halt vorstellen. Also das heißt, es soll keine akademische Einleitung werden, die könnt ihr sicherlich auf, könnt ihr selber im Netz nachlesen, ähm, sondern im Grunde genommen eher sichtbar machen, äh, wo und wie äh, Coopers theoretische Verbindungslinien halt im Grunde genommen halt auch mit einer eher marxischen ähm, Ökonomiekritik, aber andererseits einer Ideologiekritik und Feminismus halt herstellt, die sie für mein, meiner Einschätzung nach halt zu einem Glücksfall für die diesjährige Marx-Herbstschule machen. Genau, und äh, viele mögen sie ja vielleicht auch schon kennen. Also sie ist eine australische äh, Wissenschaftlerin aus dem Bereich, wie man mir sagte, der Social Science and Technology Studies. Ähm, wo sie allerdings, wie, mir, wie man mir auch sagte, äh, mit ihren feministischen und marxistischen Analysen eher ein Ausnahmefall ist. Ähm, in den letzten zehn Jahren, ähm, soweit ich das äh, einschätzen kann, lag ihr Forschungsschwerpunkt bisher eigentlich stark auf Bioökonomie im Zusammenhang mit neuen Reproduktionstechnologien, also einem relativ neuen Bereich von Biopolitik, in dem ja bekanntermaßen ein relativ großer, auch neuer kapitalistischer Markt mit steigendem Bedarf nach Körperressourcen geschaffen wurde. Genau, und Melinda Cooper hat eben zu diesem Themenbereich im Grunde genommen bereits 2008 das Buch Life as Surplus ähm, herausgebracht und ähm, dort in Life as Surplus äh, analysierte sie eben Biotechnologien ähm, in ihrer Entwicklung von den 1970ern bis heute eben im Zusammenhang eigentlich auch mit dem Aufkommen einer neoliberalen Politik, mit Ökonomie und einer entsprechenden Forschung. Genau zugleich geht es hier und aber auch in ihren weiteren Forschungen immer um, die Frage, um ein Verständnis von Akkumulationsregimen, das eben nur als Verhältnis von Produktions- und Reproduktionsverhältnissen beschrieben werden kann. Und diese Perspektive setzte sie, ähm, denke ich, sehr stark halt in ihrem Buch Clinical Labor 2014 fort, aber halt auch in dem Text Biopolitics of Reproduction, beides übrigens Texte, die sie äh, zusammen mit Catherine Waltby geschrieben hat, was, glaube ich, auch eine langjährige Zusammenarbeit ist. Genau, und anhand von ähm, konkreten Forschungen, also in beiden Texten äh, von Biotech-Märkten, am Beispiel von Indien und China wird halt eine Entwicklung halt von tra neuen transnationalen Märkten beschrieben und die Besonderheit sozusagen der Perspektive lässt sich im Grunde genommen schon an dem Namen erschließen. Clinical Labor wird nicht aus der Perspektive von Konsumentinnen oder technologischen Fortschritten erzählt, sondern ähm, versucht die Perspektive derjenigen sichtbar zu machen, die dort gegen Geld Körperfunktionen und Körperstoffe verkaufen, also wie zum Beispiel bei Eizelltransfer oder Leihgebären. Ähm, das heißt, Clinical Labor analysiert, ähm, wie sich das Bereitstellen von Körperlichkeit und Körperfunktionen im Neoliberalismus nach und nach halt immer mehr von einem Modell einer altruistischen Spende hin zu einer Form von bezahlten Arbeit halt verändert und verschiebt. Das heißt, da gibt es immer wieder sozusagen viel Verbindungslinien, die da hergestellt werden, aber der Fokus geht natürlich, der Titel sagt es schon, um Arbeitsverhältnisse und eben um neue Formen von Zugriff auf Körperfunktionen. Und damit verändert sich wiederum natürlich der Arbeitsbegriff, aber auch 
sozusagen der Anspruch danach, ähm, neue Regulierungen in Familien- und Personenstaatsrechten und im Grunde genommen auch in der nationalen Zugehörigkeit, in denen diese Körperstoffe und die Kinder, die damit entstehen, ähm, sozusagen organisiert und reguliert werden sollen. Ähm, Im Anschluss, ähm, jetzt mache ich wieder einen kleinen Sprung, äh, wie ging es dann weiter ähm, an die Veranstaltung äh, Reproductive Labors in the Global Economy, die ähm, 2012 als Gruppe Kitchen Politics äh, hier in Berlin äh, sowohl mit Silvia Federici als auch mit Melinda ähm, gemacht hatten. Also ähm, entstand halt eben tatsächlich auch die Idee zur Fortsetzung der Diskussion im Rahmen unserer Buchreihe. Ähm, genau, um es nochmal zu sagen, eben als äh, Herausgeberin Kollektiv Kitchen Politics Queer Feministische Interventionen. Und dieses Buch, ähm, was ich jetzt schon mal brav hochgezeigt habe. Sie nennen es Leben, wir nennen es Arbeit, was 2015 dann rausgekommen ist über reproduktive Technologien und den mit ihnen verbundenen Tätigkeiten und Körperstoffen versteht sich eben auch als weiterer Beitrag in einer unabgeschlossenen Reihe zum Thema reproduktiver Arbeiten im 21. Jahrhundert. Also als sozusagen Gegenstück zu dem Aufstand aus der Küche von Silvia Federici. Und äh, vielleicht auch nochmal so als Rahmen, also im Unterschied eben zu den zentralen Thesen von Feministinnen des 20. Jahrhunderts, die sich halt meistens halt im Rahmen fordistischer Familienmodelle eher mit der Bedeutung unbezahlter Reproduktionsarbeiten auseinandersetzen, geht es halt eben für das 21. Jahrhundert einzuordnen, wie und warum zunehmend auch reproduktive Arbeiten global wahnförmig bezahlt, nachgefragt und eingekauft werden. Ähm, Genau, wie verändern sich damit politische Strategien, politische Subjekte und Kämpfe? Das sind meistens ähm, Themen, die in Deutschland, aber ich glaube auch woanders bisher nicht großartig ähm, lange diskutiert wurden oder die einfach noch ausstehen. Ähm, ich beharre da jetzt so lange drauf, weil ich denke, genau eine feministische Auseinandersetzung mit dieser geschlechtlichen Zuordnung zu gesellschaftlichen Sphären und Tätigkeiten braucht halt eben angesichts einer globalisierten Arbeitsteilung auch Antworten auf diese reproduktionsmedizinischen und klinischen Dienstleistungen. Und ähm, das versucht äh, ähm, dieses Buch halt, äh, was wir gemacht haben, halt auch äh, so ein bisschen aufzublättern. Ähm, und das Interessante ist, äh, dass sozusagen der Bogen dahin, ähm, dass es in dem Buch zwar einerseits hauptsächlich um Biotechnologie, Reproduktion und Familie geht, dass aber ähm, es, denke ich, schon so eine Art zweiten thematischen Schwerpunkt in dem Buch gibt und das ist dieser Text Reproduktion neu denken, in dem halt so ein neuer Fokus von Melindas Forschungsinteressen halt sich eigentlich schon andeutet und sie schreibt da nämlich eigentlich eine politische Entwicklung dieser kapitalistischen Sphärentrennung zwischen Privat und Öffentlich, Arbeit und Heim. Ich glaube, ich muss das jetzt nicht nochmal wiederholen, weil die Beschreibung davon oder dass es das gibt, das weiß im Grunde genommen jeder, interessanterweise ist es auch ich, meistens eher erst in den frühen 80ern, zum Beispiel bei Karin Hausen, ähm, aber auch bei, ähm, ähm, jetzt finde ich nicht mehr die richtige Stelle an meinem, äh, ja genau, bei Heidi Hartmann eher sozusagen beobachtet worden, aber es ist eigentlich bisher relativ selten, ähm, vor allen Dingen nicht als rechts, äh, rechtstheoretische ähm, Analyse eigentlich ähm, beschrieben worden. Genau, und ähm, das ist eigentlich so ein bisschen der, der Weg, der mir scheint, genau dahin zu führen, zu so einer Analyse halt eigentlich zu, zu dem, was ist das, so eine ähm, ähm, Familienverhältnisse. Ähm, vielleicht nochmal ähm, vorweg geschickt, ähm, politisch zentral für Cooper ist eben immer eine Historisierung von Reproduktionsarbeiten als immanente kapitalistische Formen und eine Ablehnung aller Versuche, Reproduktionsarbeit eben in ahistorisch zu begreifen oder auch utopisch aufzuleiten. Und dieser Fokus wird halt ähm, im Zusammenhang mit Akkumulationsregimen und rechtlich abgesicherten Beziehungsformen ähm, auch in diesem Buch Family Values fortgesetzt. Und damit möchte ich eigentlich jetzt auch schon das Wort an Sie übergeben. Es wird jetzt so weitergehen, dass... Ähm, so circa 45 Minuten Präsentation kommen und danach schauen wir weiter und machen eine Diskussion. Danke.
All right, um, the title of my paper is Neoliberalism's Family Values. I don't know if that was on the poster because we changed our mind a lot. Um, but this is a synthesis of some of the ideas in a book I published earlier this year called Family Values um, Between Neoliberalism and the New Social Conservatism. Writing at the end of the 1970s, the Chicago School neoliberal Gary Becker remarked that the family in the Western world has been radically altered, some claim almost destroyed by events of the last three decades. He went on to list a familiar series of ills from the rapid rise of in divorce and female-headed female households to the decline in birth rates and the growing labor force participation of married women, which he claimed had reduced the contact between, between children and their mothers and contributed to the conflict between the sexes in employment as well as marriage. Becker believed that such dramatic changes in the structure of the family had more to do with the expansion of the welfare state in the post-war era than with feminism per se, which could be considered a consequence, a consequence rather than an instigator of these dynamics. Like many of his contemporaries, both neoliberals and neoconservatives, Becker singled out welfare for single women with children, so-called AFD, AFDC, which he dubbed the poor women's alimony, as one of the primary causes of the breakdown of the family. Fifteen years later, we find Gary Becker congratulating President Clinton on his efforts to end welfare as we know it. These efforts would soon bear fruit with the passage of Clinton's Monumental Welfare Reform Act of 1996, a piece of legislation that dramatically restricted the scope of welfare for single women with children. Clinton is infamous for installing both workfare and marriage promotion at the heart of American social policy. It is less well known that his Welfare Reform Act essentially federalized a principle of poor relief dating right back to the old poor law tradition. The principle, that is, of private family responsibility for the welfare of dependents. Even less well known is the fact that Ronald Reagan first initiated this project as governor of California in the 1970s when he sought to revive the state's old poor law rules for compelling family members to look after impoverished relatives. As defenders of the competitive free market order, Neoliberals may not have cared much for the active promotion of marriage, responsible fatherhood programs, and faith-based provision of services, all of which were supported by communitarians and social conservatives, and all of which were also included within Clinton's welfare reform. But neoliberals were certainly in favor of efforts to enforce kinship obligations as an alternative to the redistribution of income by the state. When welfare recipients refused to take care of themselves within the proper structure of the family, neoliberals believed that the state had every right to leverage or indeed to create re these relationships by force, just, it, just as it had every right to compel the long-term unemployed to work. Unmarried mothers who sought welfare from the state should first be obliged to seek support from an absent father via child support orders before the state dispersed any funds. Becker's abiding concern with the de destructive effects of public spending on the family represents a key element of his microeconomics, but one that is consistently overlooked by the critical literature on neoliberalism. Indeed, at different times and in different contexts, each of the key figures of American neoliberalism can be found invoking the idea that the natural obligations of family should serve as a substitute for the welfare state. Indeed, that the altruism of the family represents a kind of primitive mutual insurance contract that we would do well to revive today. From here derives the notion, now pervasive in American welfare practice, that the state has the right to identify and enforce legal obligations of marital support and child custody, even when the parties concerned do not consent to or recognize this relationship. 
In the absence of a suitable family structure, the state is authorized to enforce the sexual contract just as it is authorized to enforce work. So what are we to make of the fact that the same neoliberal thinkers who extolled the virtues of the free market order were also prepared to defend the legal and economic bonds of kinship as inescapable non-contractual obligations? And should we be surprised to learn that the American neoliberals were stridently opposed to the sexual privacy jurisprudence of the 1970s, which turned sexual freedom into a constitutional right and ushered in the so-called sexual revolution in family law? Or that Gary Becker and Richard Posner were opposed to no-fault divorce? Only, I argue, if we neglect the necessary role of family responsibility within the neoliberal vision of a free market order. And only if we forget the historical relationship between economic liberalism and the poor law tradition. A tradition which, in the word of one historian, confounds the moral and economic function of the family. In my recently published book, Family Values, I argue that American neoliberalism, as it matured in the 1970s, must be understood as an attempt to revive and reinvent the poor law tradition as a wholesale alternative to the mid 20th century welfare state. This was not a project that was self-evident in the Chicago School of American neoliberalism at its starting point in the 1930s and indeed was far from evident as late as 1970, when Milton Friedman could be found collaborating with President Nixon on the project of a basic guaranteed income. Rather, it crystallized in the mid-1970s, a turning point in American politics, when the perfect storm of inflation, unemployment, and the rising militancy of the new left convinced neoliberals they must articulate a much more potent critique of the expansion of welfare under President Johnson's Great Society. It is at this point that American neoliberals perfected their signature critique of the welfare state, and that American neoliberalism per se acquired its mature form, in many ways distinct from the early Chicago School neoliberalism of the 1930s. And it is, it is at this point that someone like Milton Friedman completely abandoned any attempt to reform the welfare state in its existing form. Indeed, the American neoliberals now looked back to the much older poor law tradition of relief to, to find inspiration for their welfare reform initiatives. This is a tradition that dates right back to the Elizabethan poor laws and last flourished in the late 19th century in what is referred to as the Gilded Age of American capitalism. A guiding principle of this poor law tradition was the notion of family responsibility. The principle of family responsibility for welfare has deep roots in the British and North American traditions of public relief and can be traced back to the Elizabethan poor laws of 1601, where it is stated that the father and grandfather and the mother and grandmother and the children of every poor, old, blind, lame and impotent person or other person not able to work, being of a sufficient ability, shall, at their own charges, relieve and maintain every such poor person. In other words, before the parish took any action to provide for the deserving poor, family members would be compelled to provide as much support as they could. The early American colonies imported the poor laws virtually word for word, and they were later incorporated into state legal systems during the early American Republic. These laws were continuously reinvigorated and embellished to, to adapt to what we might call periodic episodes of sexual revolution. That is, at each historical juncture where the e legal obligations of family were somehow weakened or threatened, the poor laws would be re reinforced to punish those who threatened to transfer the cost of their welfare onto the state. As divorce became more common in the 19th century, they were modified to include post-divorce child support. When slaves were enfranchised in the 1860s, they were immediately encouraged to enter formal marriages and were subsequently subject to new legal rules of family support and mutual dependence. 
In many instances, those who failed to comply with family responsibility rules were subject to criminal sanctions, such as forced labor or imprisonment. The poor laws helped the state to con contain the costs of evolving sexual mores by imposing marital and familial support as an economic obligation. If the poor were unwilling to enter into binding agreements of marriage and kinship by consent, then the state was quite happy to conjure up these unions out of thin air and impose them as a legal obligation of mutual support. These, lo these laws remained very much in vigor right up until the mid 20th century, when they came into conflict with the principles of state-managed social insurance championed by progressive New Deal social reformers. But in many instances, they were never completely overridden. In particular, the much maligned AFDC programs for single mothers with children remained firmly embedded in the poor law tradition right up until the 1960s. Far from phasing out the family responsibility provisions of AFDC, state legislati legislatures continued to strengthen them after World War II, reinforcing the idea that impoverished women should look to individual men and not the state as sources of support. Yet the fortunes of this welfare program changed dramatically around 1965, thanks in large part to the rise of a new kind of public interest lawyer working in close collaboration with the nascent welfare rights movement. In mounting their case against public assistance laws, these lawyers looked to recent changes in family law as a model of the kinds of freedom that might also be extended to those on welfare. Family, family law was effectively undergoing an extraordinary process of liberalization during this period. After more than a century of little change at all, laws that limited divorce, stigma, stigmatized non-marital unions, and discriminated against illegitimate, illegitimate children were repealed or ceased to be enforced within the space of a decade or so. And alongside the marginalization of older status-based rules governing sexual relationships, a new jurisprudence came into being that explicitly recognized sexual freedom as a con constitutionally protected right and limited the power of the state to police intim intimate sexual relationships in the home. Yet none of these innovations extended to impoverished women on welfare who were regularly subject to salacious investigations into their sexual histories, unannounced home visits, and strict moral policing under state law. As the field of family law entered a new age of relative sexual freedoms, welfare law, aptly dubbed the family law of the poor, continued to reflect the punitive moral conservatism of the poor law tradition. Relaying the most radical voices in the welfare rights movement, progressive public interest lawyers questioned why recipients of public assistance and public housing were still subject to such intrusive forms of moral surveillance. If the Supreme Court now recognized the constitutional right to sexual privacy, why should this right not be extended to women on welfare? If middle-class women were now free to dissolve marriages at will and had increasing power to earn an independent wage in the labor market, why should poor women remain imprisoned within the private bonds of economic dependence? If marriage no longer counted in determining the legal status of middle-class children, why would the children of welfare mothers still be classified as illegitimate and punished for the sins of the parents? In short, poverty lawyers were looking to the liberalization of family law to argue against the continuing enforcement of private familial obligations in the realm of welfare. And for a period of 10 years or so, they were extraordinarily successful in persuading the Supreme Court to federalize control of welfare and to align its provisions with recent changes in family law. The overall message conveyed by these rulings was that the welfare of poor women was a public responsibility on a par with that of standard male workers. Whatever their marital status, sexual history, or race, impoverished women were just as des deserving of a social wage as any other citizen. citizen. At a time when middle-class women were entering the work workforce in growing numbers and achieving some degree of econo 
economic independence from men. Unmarried women on welfare also appeared to be in reach of a social wage that was no longer mediated through a so-called substitute husband. Public assistance benefits, however menial, were functioning like a social wage for unmarried, often African-American women, a configuration that had not been envisaged in the Social Security Act, and one that many perceived as a perversion of its original intent. As Stephanie Coons points out, it was not so much women's dependence on the state that provoked the welfare backlash of the 1970s. It was rather the growing realization that welfare was making women independent of individual men and freeing them from the obligations of the private family that turned a generation of social reformers against the welfare state to cool. This aspect of the welfare rights movement is worth pausing over because it upsets the opposition between redistribution and recognition assumed by a social theorist such as Nancy Fraser. The welfare rights movement was simultaneously seeking to extend the redistributive reach of the welfare state and to repeal the panoply of normative rules regulating gender and sexuality under the New Deal welfare state. By demanding welfare benefits for all low-income women, free from moral regulation and independent of their relationship to a man, it sought to undermine the normative foundations of the family wage without renouncing the demand for a social wage. In this respect, the welfare rights movement makes a nonsense of the distinction between redistribution and recognition, a category in which Fraser includes the so-called identity claims of sexual liberation movements. Now this particular challenge to the Fordist family wage system was profoundly unsettling to people from right across the political spectrum. And it is fair to say that it crystallized the enormous welfare backlash of the 1970s. As the expanding economy of the mid-1960s gave way to the soaring inflation of the 1970s, AFDC became the touchstone for increasingly acrimonious debates about the very feasibility of welfare redistribution. In particular, the rising demands of the welfare rights movement, along with its successes in the federal courts, convinced many former pragmatic supporters of the New Deal welfare state that a crisis point had been reached. The importation of sexual freedom arguments into welfare rights law opened up the distinct possibility that the federal government, government would now be compelled to subsidize the existence of women who wantonly chose to live without the support of a man, thereby greatly increasing the burdens on state coffers. In this regard, the phenomenon of stagflation, combining inflation and unemployment, began to be understood as much more than a macroeconomic problem in the conventional sense of the term. What it reflected was a breakdown of moral order itself, an unsustainable inflation of monetary and libidinal, libidinal demands beyond the limits established by the Keynesian consensus. It was not possible to question the normative premise, uh, the normative premise of the male male breadwinner family itself without completely defeating the, the arithmetic of restrained public spending and thus generating runaway inflation. In this new economic context, free market neoliberals such as Friedman, who had once accepted the pragmatic ne necessity of a state-subsidized family, family wage, began to formulate a distinct new political philosophy of non-redistributive family values. They now perceived the perverse incentives of the great society welfare state as responsible for both a breakdown in family values and an unsustainable inflation of monetary demands. Turning against the New Deal welfare state altogether, they now called for the strategic reinvention of a much older poor law tradition of private family responsibility, using the combined instruments of welfare reform, monetary policy designed to curb wage inflation, and a permanent tax revolt incorporating constitutional limits on state spending and revenue collection. The neoliberal critique of welfare had a profound influence on the subsequent history of American social policy. 
and informed both direct efforts to revive the poor laws and much more general interventions into the realm of fiscal and monetary policy, all of which had the effect of transferring economic responsibility onto the family. As governor of California in the late 1960s and 70s, Ronald Reagan was one of the first to reinvigorate the state poor laws of family responsibility, obliging family members of the poor to pay for the costs of public assistance in whatever realm that could be uh, um, uh, uh, time spent in a public institution, welfare for the, for the blind or the disabled. Uh, he, he attempted to revive these laws on, on a general basis. As president, Reagan attempted to translate his Californian project in welfare reform onto the federal stage without success. Instead, Reagan's project was brought to final fruition by President Clinton, whose monumental welfare reform of 1996 effectively federalized the, the poor law tradition, turning America's welfare bureaucracy into an immense national apparatus for policing and enforcing child so support obligations amongst the welfare poor. But the imprint of neo neoliberal policy thinking extends well beyond these direct efforts to revive state poor laws. It can be seen also in efforts to repeal the estate tax on inherited wealth, a campaign, a campaign that was loudly supported by neoliberal thinkers in the 1970s. It can, be, it can be seen in the local and state tax revolts that began in California in the late 1970s and then spread throughout the country, uh, placing permanent limits on the power of the state to spend, tax, and most importantly, redistribute wealth a campaign in which the Virginia School of Neoliberalism was directly involved. It can be seen in the war of attrition to replace social security and work-based uh, health insurance with private asset accumulation strategies, and in efforts to promote home ownership as a form of asset-based welfare under Clinton and George W. Bush. We tend to forget how central the problematic of the family was to each of these campaigns. But it was always front and foremost in the eyes of neoliberal policymakers who saw asset-based welfare as a way of replacing the so-called impersonal bonds of social insurance with family-based forms of wealth accumulation and transmission. We can also observe multiple ways in which cuts to public funding in healthcare, education, and welfare have pushed more and more people back toward kinship kinship-based forms of self-care and mutual support, and how the expansion of consumer credit has turned household deficit spending into a substitute for state deficit spending. Today, family responsibility very often takes the form of intergenerational debt, where parents and other family members are actively enrolled in the debt obligations of children signed up as guarantors or required to post their housing wealth as collateral to fund the social mobility or simply stasis of younger generations. Here too, neoliberal policy prescriptions have played an important role, as Milton Friedman and Gary Becker were among the first to suggest that investment in human capital, such as education, should be the responsibility of the family, aided and abetted by private credit markets rather than the state. Their policy pres prescriptions have had a profound influence on higher education funding in the United States, as the federal government and states have progressively chipped away at public funding and private credit markets have expanded to fill the gap, with parents often acting as co-signers or guarantors of student debt. The shift from public to private investment in health, education, and welfare has forcefully reinvigorated the importance of family, uh, of family debt networks and inherited wealth in the shaping of social destinies. The effect of more than three dec decades of neoliberal economic reform has been to reinstate the legal and economic function of the private family as the first-line provider of welfare very much in keeping with the policy prescriptions of, of neoliberals and very much in keeping with a 400-year-old poor law tradition. In short, my reading of American uh, social history s since the 1970s seeks to demonstrate that the question of family was central to the neoliberal resurg resurgence of this period.
Yet this question is consistently overlooked in the recent critical literature on neoliberalism, where we find either a complete absence of discussion of the place of the family within free market economics, or, particularly coming from the left, the idea that neoliberalism is destructive of economic security, precisely because it is thought to promote personal freedom over and above the solidity of the Fordist family wage. We find this argument most explicitly in the work of the German social theorist Wolfgang Streck, who laments that the Fordist family was replaced by the flexible family in much the same way as Fordist employment was replaced by flexible employment. It is implicit also in Boltanski and Chappello's New World of Work, which distinguishes between a good critique of capitalism, which sought to defend the forms of economic security offered by Fordism, and a bad critique, which sought to undo the sexual and gender normativities of the Fordist family wage. Most surprisingly, however, we find the most trenchant articulation of this position in the work of Nancy Fraser, who poses the, theoretical, uh, the rhetorical question, was it mere coincidence that second wave feminism and neoliberalism prospered in tandem? Or was there some perverse subterranean affinity between the, between the two? And goes on to answer in the affirmative, claiming that our critique of the family wage now supplies a good part of the romance that invests flexible capitalism with higher meaning and moral purpose. Implicit here is the idea that the leftist critique of sexual and gender normativity was responsible for destroying the economic foundations of Fordist security and therefore paved the way for neoliberalism. Such an analysis would seem to find confirmation in Foucault's present observation that the American neoliberals were beyond normativity uninterested in the categories of abnormality or deviance that were pervasive within the 20th century social sciences and welfare state paternalism. There is, of course, a very real relationship between the dismantling of the Fordist social contract, the rise of second wave feminism, and the so-called revolution in family law. Feminism would not have amounted to much if it hadn't destroyed the family wage a system that ensured the economic dependence of women on working men. But beyond this, my argument with this literature is that it, misrep that it misrepresents the causal relationships between neoliberalism and the social movements of the late Fordist era, and therefore ends up misrepresenting neoliberalism itself. American neoliberalism was not a backlash against the post-war welfare state as such nor was it primarily a re reaction against its founding institution, the Fordist family wage. Milton Friedman was, was engaged in Nixon's project to expand the family wage. Rather, neoliberalism in its mature form must be understood as a response to the critique of the family wage coming from the feminist and anti-racist left. And it is a response that sought to restore the family by looking back to the system of private family, family responsibility that existed before the New Deal. Once we restore the question of family to its central position in the neoliberal literature, we are, we are in a much better position to understand the nuance of the neoliberal position on sexual freedom. It is almost universally assumed that neoliberal legal scholars were sympathetic to, perhaps even ultimately responsible for, the jurisprudence of privacy that transformed sexual freedom into a limited constitutional right in the 1960s and 70s. So a certain kind of left-wing critique of neoliberalism sees it as having inspired the, individual, the individualist ethics of sexual freedom choice in forming such landmark cases as the Roe versus Wade decision of 1973, and by extension, all other cases involving the recognition of a constitutional right to sexual liberty. In fact, the very opposite is true. A scholar such as Richard Posner, who otherwise supported the extension of the private commercial contract in such areas as the trade in drugs, sex, and babies, was unequivocally hostile to the idea of a constitutional right to sexual freedom, 
for the simple reason that it might impose an obligation on the state to actively enable and subsidize the freedoms in question. This was pre precisely what occurred when sexual privacy jurisprudence was extended to welfare, welfare recipients in the 1970s. Instead, neoliberals support the more limited notion that private contractual freedom, as opposed to a constitutional right to sexual freedom, should be ex extended to all arenas of social and intimate life, on the proviso that the associated costs are fully internalized by the contracting parties. Failing this, neoliberals are no less willing than social conservatives to invoke the necessity of non-contractual obligations in marriage and parenthood, and are more than prepared to call on their enforcement by the state. Richard Posner and Gary Becker were adamantly opposed to no-fault divorce, not out of any overt moral concern with the decline of family life. The rising divorce rates of the late 20th century were inevitable, Becker insists but because of the potential social costs involved in supporting dependent women and children. When women and men fail to privatize the costs of their sexual behavior, instead transferring these costs onto the state, neoliberals make an exceptional case for the imposition of non-contractual obligations in the realm of kinship. For the very same reason, neoliberal legal scholars were some of the first uh, to call for the recognition of same-sex marriage as a way of internalizing the potential social costs of HIV infection in the 1980s. If gay men could be persuaded to take care of themselves within the context of the family unit, they reasoned, then the non-normative character of their sexual relations should be completely indifferent to the state. Richard Posner refers to the insurance function of marriage, pointing to the fact that marriage is expected to, to serve as a form of uh, risk protection in those social contexts where, in his words, kinship has receded, but market and social insurance is not yet common, or we might add, has significantly diminished. Neolib neoliberal scholars are more than happy to accept non-normative lifestyles as long as they are premised on an alternative moral philosophy of private family obligation and mutual marital support. This double allegiance finds expression in the idea that non-normative sexual relationships must ultimately be channeled into the legal form of marriage. This argument was outlined at the height of the AIDS crisis of the 1980s in a context where self-care or home-based care was being loudly touted as a solution to the inflating costs of the public hospital system and, a moment, and at a moment when Reagan, interestingly, reintroduced so-called filial obligation laws making it legal for states to recoup the costs of hospital-based care from relatives. The idea that legalized marriage could help same-sex couples to take care of themselves and thus relieve the state of the burden of caring for them has been one of the most successful arguments in favor of legal reform and is pervasive in the American jurisprudence on same-sex marriage. Here we encounter an aspect of neoliberalism that eludes the terms of Foucault's now, class now classic analysis where he makes the pertinent point that neoliberals are indifferent to the categories of the normal and the deviant, and, as us, and are as such beyond normativity. Neoliberals may well be in favor of the decriminalization of drugs, sodomy, bathhouses, and prostitution, and are adamantly opposed to the kind of normative police powers that regulated or outlawed such practices under the mid-20th century welfare state. And yet the neoliberal critique of normativity also ends up endorsing an alternative form of moral philosophy. Posner's sexual ethics combines radical anti-normativity anti with an equally forceful commitment to the welfare role of the marital unit and the private family. And in some ways, I think this captures the strange double movement of contemporary queer politics, which is always pushing at the frontiers of the normative, while just as insistently reinscribing these non-normative ways of life into legally recognized forms of partnership and reproduction.
Almost all claims to non-normative sexual expression can be tolerated and recognized, it would seem, as long as they organize themselves into the form of the private family. Finally, once you recognize that American neoliberalism proposes a revival and reinvention of the poor law principle of family responsibility, you begin to understand how neoliberals have, have been able to forge such a successful working relation, relationship with social conservatives of the past three decades, a relationship that otherwise appears completely enigmatic. Neoliberals and social conservatives are equally invested in the promotion and enforcement of legal family obligations, albeit for different reasons. Neoliberals, because they are Neoliberals, because they oppose the state subsidized subsidization of irresponsible lifestyle choices, sex outside of marriage, uh, non-marital childbearing, and sexually transmitted diseases, all of which threaten to cost the state a lot of money. Neoconservatives, because they see the bonds of family life as foundational to social order itself. It is their common investment in the family that has allowed neoliberals and neoconservatives to work together, despite their profound differences on all other issues. It is therefore impossible to bypass the question of family as an explanatory lens for understa understanding the wider social transformations and alliances of the past half century. Thank you. So, wir würden ähm, tatsächlich jetzt gleich mit Fragen aus dem Publikum beginnen. Wenn ihr Nachfragen habt, vielleicht sowas zuerst, Verständnisfragen. Ansonsten vielleicht so Ankündigung, ist es ein Kommentar, ist es eine Frage? You're welcome. Wenn es erstmal keine Fragen gibt, kann ich auch erstmal, also ich hatte auch was äh, vorbereitet, ähm, aber ich dachte mir, es wäre ganz gut, erstmal so ein bisschen in ein Gespräch zu kommen, weil ich dachte auch, es wäre wichtig, nochmal so, so, so einen Rahmen zu geben, in welchem Kontext, also sozusagen, das ist ja die Marx-Herbst-Schule und es ging eigentlich auch um das Kapital und inwiefern ist jetzt so diese Konzeption, die ähm, <lacht> Melinda vorstellt über, das, äh, über die Familie, inwiefern hängt das jetzt mit, ähm, ist das, findet sich da eigentlich eine brauchbare Kritik bei Marx oder inwiefern hat jetzt so Marx Reproduktion und die Familie kritisiert und ähm, genau, vielleicht könntest du dazu noch mal was sagen, wie das aneinander andockt oder wo sich da eine Kritik findet, genau. I think I might improvise. Okay, so I think. Um, okay, so I think um, Marx and Engels are very ambivalent about the family, and they can be very interesting and very uninteresting. Um, so I'll, I'll begin by saying I um, I have a disagreement with the. Uh, common uh, Marxist feminist uh, contention that Marx uh, ignores uh, reproductive labor or re ignores the foundational uh, position of uh, reproductive labor within the creation of economic value. I think that's both true and uh, not true. Um, it's true in the sense that he has, if you look at uh, the first volume of Capital, he has a He doesn't have anything in the way of an explicit uh, theory of reproductive labor um, on, on the same scale as his explicit theory of uh, productive labor. But uh, 
when you look at his, uh, he has a kind of ideal, typical uh, um, understanding of what the sexual division of labor is, and it is, you know, uh, the man in the factory and the woman at, at home. And this is in the first uh, part of uh, volume one of uh, Capital. So, uh, in a sense, it's there, but it's so unthinkingly foundational that he doesn't theorize it. Um, so to that extent, I recognize the, the, the value of the Marxist feminist uh, critique. But on the other hand, what's interesting to me is that this particular sexual division of labor did not exist at all amongst the English working class at the time he was writing. And to me, it's uh, fascinating that he uh, idealized this sexual division of labor before it even existed. And what, what he does do in the later part of uh, volume one of Capital is recount the process by which women were uh, ousted from the factories. So young women were massively employed in the factories and children at the time Marx was writing uh, uh, the first uh, volume of Capital. So there was not at all this sexual division uh, of labor. And if you look at uh, Marx's kind of uh, later very historical narrative of the factory acts, which becomes much less explicitly conceptual, um, you realize that he was quite sympathetic to the movement which combined uh, trade union leaders and Tory paternalists, social, social conservatives, to protect women by getting them out of their factory. So in a sense, he is uh, essentializing what is a division of labor and a creation of the private family that had to be enacted through a kind of quite a violent, you know, process of ousting women, relegating them to the uh, lesser paid uh, categories of factory labor and then to domestic service, which really kind of only got going after the 1870s. So to me, the most interesting part of... Uh, uh, Marx on the family is this part where he's kind of unconscious of what he's doing or saying because he is so sympathetic to the factory reformers who want to get women out of the factories. And what he's not uh, able to theorize here is the process by which uh, the division between productive and reproductive labor is created. And to me, that is the interesting question. So a kind of um, a caution I have with a certain kind of tendency in Marxist feminist work to want to posit reproductive labor as the foundation of all economic value, the kind of trap door behind the labor theory of value. We must recognize it and value it and uh, uh, value women's place within it, is that it uh, uh, takes as given a division of labor which is always being, always being quite aggressively reasserted. And it's that process that I think we should begin by critiquing rather than by uh, ex essentializing and extolling social reproduction as if it were um, an ontological foundation to all value. To me that seems an implicitly social conservative uh, move. So that is a, a difference I have with um, of course, not all Marxist feminists, but there is uh, that tendency. Um, so having said that, like in the first, uh, you know, you, you could write a book on Marx on the family, so um, I, d I didn't do that. Um, but um, um, in the first uh, chapter of this book, I set out the way I'm kind of, you know, using Marx in the back of my head because he's, a thinker you're, you're always thinking with and everyone has their own kind of trajectory through Marx. And what is most interesting uh, to me is uh, his analysis of the double movement of capital in the Gundrissa. He, he's, I find this extremely uh, interesting. It's, it's extremely sparse and abstract. And he's talking about uh, capital as inhabited by this double movement, which is all about both displacing limits, expanding frontiers, always seeking to abolish any kind of prior order of established uh, social relations, status-based relations. And at the same time, he recognizes that capital, because it needs property or appropriation, also needs to recreate this artifice of tradition, of inheritance, of hierarchical order. And of course, he doesn't extend. This is when you look at Deleuze and Guattari's uh, work. I did my doctoral thesis on Deleuze and Guattari. So, this what I retained from their work, despite lots of other <laughs> problems, is uh, they also think this movement, deterritorialization, re-territorialization, is like the most interesting uh, 
perspective that Marx offers on capital. Like it, com it completely kind of um, overrides the labor theory of value, which is foundational, because it's like saying capital needs to create foundation. So it goes a step back. And you know what Marx never does is extend this dynamic to the question of gender and sexual relations. And I just think it's completely illuminating if you extend it there because um, there is something quite enigmatic about the fact that the social history of capitalism, if you look at it, you see, you see ways in which capital is able to, to, to leverage the destabilization of sexual and gender relations in a quite kind of agnostic way at various points. You know, it was able to leverage, you know, uh, the fact that, I mean, in racial relations too, so it leverages migration, it lever leverages the fact that women want to escape the, uh, the family, this kind of thing. Um, so it makes it look very agnostic. But um, or it, at the same time, you see this constant reassertion of the family, of some kind of order of reproduction or inheritance or kinship. And what seems to happen is that there's a kind of expansion of who is included in this order of reproduction. So in the 19th century, you know, uh, uh, women gained greater rights within the family. Laws outlawing uh, um, inter-race marriage are overturned. You see this gradual expansion. Um, um, so an interesting moment, you know, slaves were, were enfranchised, but they were immediately subject to these really brutal laws forcing them uh, to marriage and back into the family. Laws that if they broke, so if they were cohabiting, they could be forced back into convict labor. And um, so I think this needs to be examined as part of uh, 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 the capitalist uh, double movement and um, the legal, the American legal historian Riva Siegel talks about the history of the family as one of transformation through preservation. So I think it captures this double movement that Marx is talking of in really interesting ways. Of course, it also captures what is happening with uh, same-sex marriage and the very kind of um, family family obsessed thing that you get in a lot of queer politics at the moment. Even the most um, self-avowedly non-normative, uh, you get this kind of radical anti-normativity combined with this complete uh, obsession with uh, childbearing, the family, kinship. It's very strange, but I think it kind of speaks to that uh, double movement. It's one of those moments in history. There's lots and lots of them. You could look at all kinds of different uh, examples. So I think um, as, you know, as, as boring as Marx can be in his personal politics at times, and he just kind of coughs it up and <laughs> recounts it in, in uh, Capital. It's all there, and you can take his more abstract intuition about the double movement of Capital and like radicalize Marx and extend it to this intimate uh, area, and you get a very interesting uh, point of view on the sexual politics of Capital, and one that I think avoids that foundationalism that you can find in a lot of uh, Marxist uh, feminism, which is kind of a reproductive labor theory of value that uh, we have to hold on to this and assert the value of what we have done and um, ask for it to be recognized. I, I don't think you need to protect reproduction in order to fight for better you know, wages and conditions for people doing domestic work. I just don't think the two go together. I think it's a, um, a slippage. And what, I, what I've tried to do with uh, rereading of the welfare rights movement in the uh, 1970s is that people have uh, interpreted it as uh, wages for housework. Um, but that was precisely what Nixon and Milton Friedman were interested in doing. They, they, when they were extending the family wage, it was wages for housework. They wanted to um, recompose the African-American family, which they thought had been um, uh, castrated by welfare, that it was giving too much power to these kind of maternal castrating African-American women, too much sexual freedom. And uh, they wanted to... Uh, uh, confine the family wage to uh, married cohabiting uh, men and African American men and women, and that was wages for housework. What the welfare rights movement was doing, or a marginal group within it, was saying, <laughs> no, we don't want to be uh, uh, pushed into these kind of normative sexual relationships. We want to get a, 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 a social wage, whatever sexual relationship we're in, you know, independently. Um, so I think, you know, the, 
there's always a rereading of history. If neoliberalism was nostalgic for the poor law tradition, there's part of the left that is nostalgic for the Fordist family wage. And I'm always trying to uh, say, no, there was this more interesting m moment and a more interesting uh, current within the movements of the 60s and 70s, which <laughs> was not about uh, extending the family wage. It was about extending redistribution, but completely undoing sexual normativity. And it's just amazing the, the, um, the intensity of the hatred that that, uh, um, that that catalyzed in that period that, you know, people from the left, people from the left skipped over to the right. The neoconservatives were, you know, Soviet Trotskyists, they became neoconservatives. Everyone just moved to the right and because it was, you know, perceived as uh, too much, but it was a very interesting movement. Fragen zur Familie? Hello, uh, thanks for your talk. I feel the question. Um, I think you showed quite well, or you traced how this, um, yeah, how family figured in uh, the neoliberal politics in the US. And I was wondering, do you think that there, that from this very particular discussion that you have, um, you know, that, that you have, uh, brought forward here, you could kind of draw more uh, general conclusions for the gendered politics of neoliberalism, or does it make sense to talk about a more global, a more global, uh, does it make sense to ask this question, or do you always have to be very particular when talking about different neoliberalisms? So can you, yeah, can you draw those more global conclusions as to the accord between neoliberalism and gender from what you've just discussed in your talk. You mean um, comparisons to other countries? Yes. Yeah, I think you can. I mean, of course, there's uh, significant uh, differences, and I'd love to hear what people have to say about um, Germany. I mean, I was at a, a meeting last year, and people were talking about the auto liberals, and um, what I found really interesting was that um, there was no division uh, between, uh, um, I guess, neoliberalism and social conservatism in the work of the auto liberals. They were both at the same time. Um, so there's that. Um, I mean, I always think of Australia, and I can, without there being such a strong social conservative, popular social conservative tradition in Australia. It's certainly there, and Australians are always underestimating it. But without it being as strong as the United States, I mean, everything in welfare law, in uh, uh, the inflation of housing assets, in monetary policy, which has all been about inf inflating housing, has pushed people back into family forms of support to the point that, I mean, a city like Sydney to me is transformed because people don't move out. I mean, uh, there's this everyday dependence on the family um, that uh, is, is a result of what look like unintentional uh, policy reforms. Um, so th there's very deliberate ways in, in unemployment uh, policy in which uh, kind of family and marital support has been reinscribed as well. So I, I do think it is uh, generalizable. Um, it's just that um, I guess it's a moment where a lot of people are talking about neoliberalism in over generic ways. So I, I found it very important to just focus on this one uh, case study. Um, and, and, and also because um, it's just so blatant in the neoliberal, American neoliberal literature what the backlash of the 70s was about, that it was about the family, and it was about this one completely marginal welfare program. It, was, it consumed less than 1% of the federal budget. So the enormity of the hysteria was completely disproportionate. And it was just, it's just crying out for analysis. And it, it just it so strikes me that there is this massive literature on neoliberalism uh, that can look at Gary Becker, who's screaming out family page after page, uh, 
and tell you it's all about individualism. And I, I don't understand that, uh, that uh, blind spot. So I, to me, it was just uh, waiting to be written. I, I have a question concerning your, your general conceptualization between normativity and, and non-normativity. So your claim was to say in a certain way that neoliberalism um, creates a certain kind of non-normativity, uh, uh, but then at the very end um, you tried to say, so um, if we look um, at, at the, at the uh, postmodern welfare state, um, there is at the same time the claim to reduce uh, the costs um, in a certain way, which produces a, a new normativity um, of a different kind, which links him at the same time uh, to um, neoconservative uh, movements. And so I'm, I'm not quite sure then how you would understand this first claim uh, that neoliberalism is about um, anti-normativity or non-normativity if it produces um, um, a different normativity in a different sphere. So how, how you would see the link between this uh, non-normative and the normative element? Yeah, good question. I think it's uh, non-normative in the sense that it is uh, completely indifferent to, um, I mean, I use norm normalization in a very kind of Foucauldian sense. I just take that on, on board. So it is a very particular way of organizing uh, difference around that kind of um, relates to, I mean, demographic and statistical theories of deviation. So it's about norm and the deviation, perversion and uh, whatever. And um, which was, you know, really part and parcel of 20th century social policy and welfare state paternalism. So neoliberalism is completely indifferent to that. It's completely indifferent to the um, nature of sexual identity. Okay, and the nature of sexual relations. Um, so, um, you know, they, they had no problems with, uh, you know, promiscuous gay uh, sex other than the f fact that it costs the state money. Um, I don't say that they reimpose normativity. I say that they're interested in legitimacy, to, which to me is of, of a different order. It's a very kind of, um, you know, uh, minimal requirement. They need a... Uh, uh, social costs to be re-internalized within some kind of uh, uh, mutual support uh, structure. And therefore, they need some kind of mutual obligation that is legally enforceable, whether that be by marriage or civil partnership. And they also need inheritance. I mean, that is um, a different kind of legal tradition to normativity, which to me is connected to the specifically uh, uh, 19th and 20th century social sciences. So they're anti-normative but pro-legitimacy pro in an expanded sense. Thank you for the very interesting talk. Um, could you please restate uh, your critique on Nancy Fraser because I just got lost for a moment yeah. and I want to I wanna get it. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Well, Nancy Fraser distinguishes between uh, politics of redistribution, which is all about redistribu redistributing the wage or the social wage, a movement toward greater equality and economic security, and what she calls movements of recognition, which are all about identity. And in that uh, category, she places uh, gender uh, and movements for the recognition of gender difference and, and uh, sexuality. Um, so um, part of this, uh, I mean, there's a group of people who are very now leftists who are very critical of the social movements of the 70s because they say they were uh, forerunners of neoliberalism. They got us into this place where it's all about identity, politics, sexual freedom. It's all very frivolous and hedonistic. Uh, but when we destroyed uh, uh, the family wage, we did redistribute we destroyed the kind of um, primary vehicle of redis economic redistribution of this period. So we swapped uh, recognition for, we swapped redistribution for recognition. 
And uh, my, my critique of uh, that is that um, if you look at the history of American welfare or any, any history of modern uh, welfare, um, uh, uh, differences of gender, sexuality, and race are what define the limits of redistribution. They're completely uh, integral. Um, so that you can't, one is not a superstructure, the, you know, recognition. Um, and simply what, so that the, to me, the most interesting anti-normativity movements of the, the uh, 70s, and the ones that were rightly perceived as most threatening were those such as the African-American welfare rights movement um, that were questioning uh, 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 the limits to sexual freedom under the New Deal welfare state and demanding greater redistribution. So that you just cannot make that uh, cleavage between redistribution and recognition there. Having said that, I do have a critique of what people uh, kind of loosely call identity politics, but I have another definition of it. I just, um, I don't think minority politics and I don't think the politics of uh, uh, sexual uh, freedom is reducible to what people call identity politics. Um, hi, thanks of all. Uh, first of all, thanks a lot for your, um, uh, for your very interesting talk. I have a question on your remarks on what you call the uh, uh, double movement of capitalism, because that sort of chips in for me uh, with that feeling that I have that um, the phenomenon that you, are, that you outlined are sort of symptoms of a more uh, more global phenomenon, namely that while, um, you know, historically capitalism introduced certain mediated forms of power and dominance, uh, mediated through law, mediated through uh, state institutions in the era of neoliberalism, quite ironically, it sort of reintroduces uh, quote-unquote pre-modern non-mediated forms of power and dominance, such as structures of kinship or such as what Holkheimer has referred to as the reign of records. And I would be interested in your, your take on that. Yeah, it is really interesting that, um, I mean, inheritance, what is really interesting about Piketty's book is, I mean, the really salient uh, uh, message I get from that is just the kind of massive, uh, uh, the, the the importance that uh, uh, inheritance has reassumed, um, that is, it, it is so dominant uh, in a way that uh, it wasn't in the 60s and 70s where uh, social spending on the part of the state could alleviate some of the kind of uh, the brute impact of inherited wealth. So that is really like a resurgence of feudal forms of appropriation or pre-modern anti-meritocratic. Um, yeah, <laughs> it is interesting, and I, I can see uh, uh, lots of examples of that. I mean, even even our forms of xenophobia seem to kind of jump back over the social state. So they jump back over biological racism and go back to kind of uh, 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 cultural xenophobia, which is a much older kind of form of racism. Um, I don't know what to say, but it is really interesting. It's all, it's all a bit kind of, yeah, sci-fi, this, the hypermodern and kind of feudal. Schön. Wenn ich mir erlauben kann, den Bogen ein bisschen größer zu schlagen. Die Leute sitzen ja hier für das Kapital an sich. Und ähm, wenn wir die Produktivität der Wirtschaften nehmen, USA und Deutschland, die waren ja in gewissem Sinne vergleichbar. Äh, da hat man die Tatsache, dass 1910 eigentlich 
für 100 Leute 20 Menschen das Produkt geschafft haben. Also 80 hätten zu Hause geblieben, hätten zu Hause bleiben können, würde uns ja alle besser gehen, oder die hätten die Arbeit geteilt. Ich, ich frage mich, wie das gelingt, dass man die Menschen so von Jahr zu Jahr dümmer machen kann. Es also, ist fast das unvorstellbar, wie dumm die Leute sind und wie inkompetent. Wie sehen Sie die Entwicklung über einen längeren Zeitraum, speziell USA, äh, der Trump, der junge Mann dort, ist ja, hat ja seine Gründe, dass er an der Macht ist. Ähm, wie ist denn diese Sozialgeldentwicklung über die Machtkämpfer? Die USA hat ja unheimlich viele Auslandsstützpunkte, äh, gibt eine unglaubliche Rüstungsfinanzierung. Äh, und wenn wir hier sitzen, und hier geht es uns ja nicht um die Sexualität, das ist ja eigentlich ein unwichtiges Thema, sondern hier geht es uns, ja <lacht> uns ja eigentlich um die Befreiung des Individuums. Und da soll doch jeder machen, was er will. Ja? Das heißt, in Deutschland keimt das ja manchmal auf, nicht? die SPD verdichtet das immer wieder. Ähm, aber wie kann es dir gelingen, dass wir die Produktivität der Gesellschaft, wir hätten schon lange nicht mehr arbeiten müssen, nach rationalen Erwägungen, ja? sondern uns nur noch kümmern müssen, wie bekommen wir mit dieser ungeheuren Produktivität der Gesellschaft hin, dass das einzelne Individuum frei ist, egal ob Männchen, Weibchen, Schwul, ist völlig gleichgültig. Und wo bleibt da die Kraft? Hat der Sanders eine Idee gehabt? Der Trump hat doch mit diesem Problem zu kämpfen. Der hat doch nicht umsonst nur, der gibt doch wirklich Konflikte, der Rostgürtel, was auch immer. Also das ist ja unvorstellbar, wie dumm wir sind. Und wo sehen Sie da was? That's true. We? You, you wanna, where are we? You wanna, we? I don't know. Das, das hatten wir schon gestern, dass daraus nicht richtig eine Frage entstand. Ja. Insofern können wir auch aber wie ich, gestern dann direkt zur nächsten äh, gehen. Ich weiß nicht, wie du das siehst, aber. Eigentlich, also ich erinnere, eigentlich nur, weil wir jetzt schon gestern waren. Genau, ich äh, würde mich jetzt, glaube ich, gerne einfach selber mal gerade einmischen, weil es so ein schönes Beispiel für den sozusagen ähm, den immer ja im Kapital enthaltenen Universalismus sein soll. Ne? Also sozusagen angeblich wisch, also, äh, wischt ja sozusagen die industrielle Produktion irgendwie so dem Kapital, soll es ja immer egal sein, wen es beschäftigt. Ähm, und ähm, also ich habe das tatsächlich so ein bisschen... Ähm, deine ähm, Rede halt eher so verstanden, dass sich, wenn man sich so die politischen Bewegungen im 19. Jahrhundert halt anguckt, ähm, dass ja keineswegs so der Fall war, dass das ähm, sozusagen alle Geschlechter gleichermaßen gearbeitet haben ähm, oder ähm, sozusagen sich alle Differenzen zwischen den Leuten, die gearbeitet haben, aufgelöst haben. Eher im Gegenteil ähm, war es ja leider nicht so, dass die Gewerkschaften für gleiche Löhne ähm, zum Beispiel angetreten sind im 19. Jahrhundert. Also vielleicht könntest du einfach noch mal so ein bisschen, also gab es denn eigentlich, also ich frage mich halt so, wann ist eigentlich der Punkt gekommen, an dem so diese, ähm, also diese, diese Bewegung, ähm, ich bin zwar für gleiche Rechte, aber ich brauche eine Frau, die bei mir zu Hause ist und die äh, für was anderes sorgt. Ähm, wann ist die eigentlich unterbrochen worden? Also wann gab es da ähm, eigentlich mal sozusagen eine soziale Bewegung, die das äh, in Frage gestellt hat? Maybe I translate. No? When did a social movement? Emerge? Yeah, I mean, I I was asking uh, I, when I, when I wrote your your article on uh, rethink and reproduction, it was pretty much about the 19th century mm -hmm. that you you find that the distribution or the the dif differentiation between women and men was constructed by a big alliance. And then I also ask when, but when was this? Um, let's say, or by, by which political means were this um, um, gender bias um, yeah, criticized then? When was it ended? Well, I mean, there's, you, you can find numerous instances where it's being dissolved or threatened, um, and you don't, there doesn't have to be an overt feminist movement for that to happen. So at the end of the 19th century, in the, in 
you know, a lot of the reforms of the Gilded Era were directed against the notion that there had been some kind of gender confusion, there had been mass migration to the cities, uh, women and men of all races were mixing together. So a lot of, you know, there was a resurgence of family responsibility rules then. So you see these recurrent uh, periods of so-called family in crisis. <laughs> um, that's why I begin my book by saying the family mm -hmm. is always in crisis. The history of the family is one of perpetual crisis because these movements are perpetually trying to uh, reinstall a proper sexual division of labor. Often, uh, sometimes through the poor laws, but uh, when there are more progressive groups involved, it will be through the family wage. So the family will be, normative gender relations will be subsidized. That's their kind of social democratic uh, side. So I can, see, I think I can see, um, you know, um, I just, there isn't only any one instance where this happens. The 70s was a particularly interesting period because I think um, the movements of this era were so uh, powerful. They were in the United States anyway. Um, I mean, I think it's interesting uh, now the paper that I was going to present was on the theory of uh, secular uh, stagnation, a very disturbing revisionist history of the global financial crisis, which claims that uh, the reason why we're still in this lingering disinflation is that this is a demographic crisis. Basically, uh, populations are aging, which is a nice way of saying women aren't breeding enough. Uh, and when that happens, we get permanent disinflation. So that the only way to uh, bolster uh, inflation is to get women, subsidize women, uh, reproducing again. And this is just all over um, the center left. It comes from uh, uh, Larry Summers, who in the United States would be centrist left, they would call him uh, liberal. It's been taken up in Germany by people like Hans Werner Zinn, I think. And, you know, like there's serious articles in, you know, on social progressive sites, there's one article that blames the contraceptive pill for low inflation and low interest rates. And, um, you know, it's interesting to me that this is just recurrent, that economic crisis, particularly when it's deflationary, is retrospectively understood uh, as being um, a crisis of reproduction, of um, basically women not breeding enough. Um, you know, forget the fact that uh, the European Union, the monetary policy of the European Union for 30, 40 years has been disinflation, constitutionalized disinflation. No, it's because women aren't reproducing. <laughs> anyway, um, so these, these, there's nothing new about these ideas. They're, they're really kind of monotonous. Um, that's why I, I find it interesting you know, I'm not a historian, but I like to work historically because I think we get lost in these traps of uh, forgetting what the interesting moments were. You know, what provoked the backlash of the 1970s was a really interesting development, I think. Um, and why people are so scared of inflation is um, really because it was understood as tied to uh, sexual freedom. I mean, this was quite, this is not a secret in the literature of the period. It was an inflation of uh, libidinal demands. This is what the neoconservatives were uh, telling people, and even neoliberals. This was an inflation of desire that could not be sustained. Um, so I think it's interesting, it's important to, to, to capture that there, that there were these moments uh, that were not caught between the double bind of neoliberal familialism or social democratic familialism, which is where the left often goes um, in moments of crisis. Ich habe eine Frage, weil du sagst. Um also sexuelle Freiheit ist im, äh, im Neoliberalismus kein Problem, wenn, ähm, wenn sie dann die Form von äh, Familie, also in, in die Form der Familie ähm, äh, kommt äh, und so Kinder oder alleinerziehende Mutter nicht äh, zu Lasten des Staates äh, fallen, sondern äh, dann von der Familie, äh, innerhalb von einer Familie auch äh, dafür gesorgt wird. Aber was denkst du dann von, also, mh, von Phänomenen wie Homophobie, wie wir das jetzt auch äh, 
weiß ich nicht, zum Beispiel, also ganz also rechte Positionen, die, 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 die homophobisch sind, die auf, auf keinen Fall äh, äh, Ehe, äh, Homo-Ehe oder sogar äh, äh, Adoption äh, mhm. in, keiner, mhm. in keiner möglichen Form äh, mhm. äh, sozusagen durchgehen lassen mhm. würden, ist das jetzt... Äh, mhm. Weil Neoliberalismus in der Krise ist oder wie würdest, was würdest du dazu sagen? No, 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 those positions are not neoliberal, they're social conservative. Um, so they can take, come from any tradition, a kind of religious conservative, communitarian, neoconservative, but they're social conservative uh, uh, traditions. What, so neoliberals do not, are not homophobic in that sense. Um, They're not norm normative in that sense. What is nevertheless interesting to me is that, I mean, particularly when you look at America, neoliberal policymakers have consistently worked together with no problem at all with the most conservative of moral conservatives, particularly on issues of social policy. Um, and, you know, it's an enigma. And to, to me, the only explanation is the fact that they do converge around the question of family. So where neoliberals don't have the overt homophobia, they always say, you know, well, as long as you're in the family, as long as you privatize the costs of your uh, um, uh, um, maintenance, your health, your education within the family, it's fine. So they're not homophobic. They've just always uh, been able to work with social conservatives. Hi, good evening. Good evening, everyone. Um, my question has to do with advocacy and also social movement building and strengthening because in the, re in the last couple of years, we've seen um, the private sector using the same language as activist, feminist activists. For example, we've seen advertisements around care work, you know, sharing the load or sharing the, sharing the burden between, usually between women and men. And we've also seen the development of inclusion and diversity policies in major corporations such as Goldman Sachs, Accenture, and all that. Um, given that, do you see any, any challenges or any threats in whether it's, it's the co-optation of language, given that we, we, are, also com we are also delivering the, those key messages, but we have a certain, uh, usually feminist activists would be, will be coming from a certain you know, standpoint in history of struggle compared with private sector. Yeah, I mean, to me, that is not at all surprising that, I mean, the thing about economic uh, liberalism, you know, either in its kind of 19th century version or, or neoliberalism, what defines it is adaptivity. So it, uh, it adapts to uh, um, uh, demands for social freedom of, of any kind. I'd, I don't think I would, s would see the same corporations, say, uh, supporting a kind of... Um, you know, attacks on wealth or, uh, <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, comprehensive redistribution. And to me, that makes sense. I mean, on the other hand, I don't think it's... Um, it doesn't worry me I, when people get their knickers in a knot <laughs> about it. It just doesn't worry me. You know, I just think, yeah, of course, they're going to do that. So by me, um, I'd like to come back to Marx <laughs> and uh, probably, um, yeah, also I'd, I'd like to ask you uh, how does your work relate to Marx's feminist concepts because you already stressed that you, let's say, you don't, uh, yeah, su support the, the, the form of social, yeah, social reproduction, but then the question is, 
what means the form of social re reproduction and sometimes I also get a bit lost mm. between, yeah. 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 Maybe could, you could... I could. Uh, yeah, I think, you know, these are the Cypri uh, concepts, which is why I tend not to use them unless I'm talking about Marx or Marxist feminism. So I think there's a slippage between the concept of reproductive labor and the concept of social reproduction. And so reproductive labor can refer to anything from actual reproduction, reproductive labor, having children, surrogacy, um, to domestic work, to nannying, to sex work. And then there's a concept of social reproduction, which I think, I mean, to be blunt, I think it's a bad concept in the way it's been uh, 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 leveraged by uh, Marxist feminism, because I don't think you can separate it from its uh, lineage in 19th century theories of biological heredity and legal inheritance, which were its reference at the time. And I don't think Marx himself ever kinds of, kind of gets rid of these uh, uh, um, uh, connections. And so social reproduction for me inevitably uh, uh, refers to an order of reproduction, whether you like it or not. So a certain way of organizing uh, the family or the nation, kinship or the social. Um, so it sounds very fuzzy when, when feminists talk about social uh, reproduction. It begs the question, uh, why would the social need to be reproduced? And I think there's that presumption in work, Marx's work when he talks about uh, expand, simple and expanded reproduction. There's a presumption in his work, and he says it outright in the, the, you know, the first part of uh, volume one of Capital. Uh, the worker's race, it's the word he uses, uh, needs to be reproduced. So there's this idea that uh, uh, the proletariat is this kind of you know, quasi quasi lineage that needs to be reproduced in time through some kind of process of transmission. It, it's not legal inheritance, but it's biological heredity. And you've got to ask why feminists would be interested in the idea that something called the working class or the social needs to be reproduced. I mean, I, I don't get it. I, I think you can... Um, uh, 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 imagine and organize all kinds of, uh, um, you know, uh, interventions into the domestic work, demands for higher work, without appealing to this idea of an order of reproduction. So that's why I'm also very skeptical of the idea that what we are witnessing is a permanent crisis of social reproduction. To me, that becomes very close to the leftist version of the crisis of the family. So I don't think reproduction is in crisis because I don't know what order of reproduction I would want to uh, defend. Uh, so I guess I would reverse uh, the question and coming back to this, uh, uh, what I find interesting in the, the Grundrisse is to say, well, how are these orders of reproduction asserted and what is it in the dynamic of capital which seems to demand that some kind of order of reproduction is always reimposed on the alleged free movement of labor? Why is this necessary? And it seems to me that the, you know, the family is an order of reproduction in all its variable forms, the nation is an order of reproduction, race is an order of reproduction, religious community can be an order of reproduction, it can be completely cultural. But the work that these uh, figures perform is that of designating who is performing proper productive work, who is reproducing producing the work of the nation or the work of the working class, and who is surplus to requirements. So Marx has this very interesting passage where he's talking about uh, the Irish working class in England. And of course, they were a colonized people, and the English working class hated them and saw them as competitors. Again, you know, a very old... Uh, history, uh, because they were considered as surplus to national, the requirements of national production, simply by virtue of English colonization, they were paid less, they were treated as the reserve army, they were always there, but dispensable, underpaid, you know, in surplus. I think the family plays the same role. Once you uh, assert this idea uh, that women 
somehow belong, you know, preternaturally to the family. They're somehow predestined to the work of kinship in some kind of natural uh, way, which Marx does. Um, then women in the workforce are always in surplus. They're always a kind of reserve army. They shouldn't quite be there, but they're uh, there. And in periods of crisis, you'll typically hear a call to get them out. And, but even in periods of non-crisis, it's this imposition of a certain order of reproduction which will define women as in surplus, therefore flexible, therefore called upon to always be giving something for free, you know, always this conflation between uh, women and the gift. So they're always under the shadow of the family, women in, in uh, the workforce. So my approach to social, the idea of social reproduction would be to, to, to treat it as uh, one of these figures of appropriation that capitalism is always calling up and invoking in order to reimpose these divisions in, in the workforce. Marx, when he talks about these surplus populations, he talks about unproductive surplus, which I think is a really nice um, concept, unproductive uh, surplus. It's not that they don't produce or work. Obviously, the Irish did produce some work. Our uh, migrants do produce some work. Um, but they're unproductive surplus because it, it is assumed, often even by working class organizations, that production is national. Okay? So that there's surplus to national, the requirements of national uh, production. And I think you can extend that concept to reproduction and talk about unreproductive surplus. So if you look at different moments of crisis, you'll see in all kinds of different ways, various categories of women will be accused of being underreproductive if they're uh, citizens, overreproductive if they're migrants or if they're uh, racial minorities, or simply anti-reproductive. And that applies not just to, uh, uh, say, sterile women or single women or lesbians, but to uh, you know, gays, queers, because they threaten uh, the order of the family. So to me, a more interesting uh, kind of entry point into Marx's work would be to begin with these from the vantage point of unproductive surplus and unreproductive surplus, the unreproductive surplus population, rather than to begin with the idea of social reproduction, which to me, like despite the best efforts of uh, uh, Marxist feminism, can never be separated from the idea that there's an order of reproduction, that there's an order of genealogy that precisely needs to be reproduced. And to me, that is the thing that you should be questioning uh, from the very beginning. So maybe my, my last question would be then in contrast to this, um, uh, yeah, maybe referring back to clinical labor, um, yeah. why do you use the, the, um, reproductive labor in what sense? Because yeah. it's, it's neither, it's a more an, an analytical term or why do you choose to, yeah. Well, I co-wrote the book. <laughs> hmm? I co-wrote the book, uh, so we had disagreements. About, uh, about what? <laughs> um, I, I, th I think probably, probably Catherine Wolby would see reproductive labor as kind of the source of all productive value. Mm -hmm. So I, I, that's, yeah, on that fundamental issue we differed. Um, but also because when you're talking about surrogacy, that is one um, category where reproductive labor makes sense. Having said that, you can think of, a, you know, this is where you see the ambiguity of the term because some women, you know, the surrogate, the surrogate is always seen as both uh, contributing to the reproduction of the family and threatening to the reproduction of the family. Like the whole point of the surrogacy contract is to keep her out of having rights over the child. So this is where you see the ambivalence and the, the slipperiness of the concept of reproduction itself. I don't have any solution to that one. Just, I don't know how you would what else you would use for surrogate labor. I mean, at times we used assisted reproductive labor. <laughs>
Yeah, but it, it's, of course, it's n not um, your exclusive idea, but to, to put it as work or as, as a labor is... Oh, as work, work yeah, absolutely, work. yeah, it's work. Yeah. It's not just unpaid work in that case, it's self-evidently work, you know, there's a contractual uh, relation that it's, um, yeah, it's independent contract work. Definitely. Why? <laughs> is that... Is that um, I try to come back to, let's say, to, to the relation between family values within uh, the non-contractual or mm -hmm. the, the family contracts and uh, then the, the labor relations, mm -hmm. the outsourcing of, um, mm -hmm. let's say, the, the family relations, mm. which are in a tension mm. to the, each other. And the question was a bit, uh, um, is uh, um, reproductive labor then, the, let's say, the, the concept that you link both issues with each other or...? Yeah, I think I was talking about, uh, um, in Kitchen Table, about the way contract law works in surrogacy. So for a, a family to invite a surrogate to provide a child, there needs to be um, ideally complete freedom of contract, of commercial contract, so that it's extended into the realm of kinship. And that is not at all self-evident in most jurisdictions. So California and, part, and India, I think still, uh, are um, exceptions, so that's why there's such a flourishing industry there. But on the other hand, because people don't want their uh, intended child just to keep circulating on the market, they want to kind of recapture it within uh, uh, custodial, familial relations, at some point they have to stop the surrogate from uh, claiming rights to the child. And what is very interesting is that there again you see this operation of non-contractual obligations suddenly appear. So there's this legal term specific performance which requires, in only certain jurisdictions such as California and India, uh, which requires that a surrogate who has carried a baby um, cannot opt out of the contract even if she changes her mind. It's completely anomalous within private contract law, and it's almost as if kinship law, family law, is overriding commercial law at this point. Um, because the, the distinctness of uh, family and kinship relations is about non-contractual obligations. You cannot just keep uh, uh, exchanging. At some point, uh, the labor has to be contained. So that, then this is the limit to the, to the term reproductive labor because this kind of contract is not dealt within labor relations. Well, I mean, it's an interesting question. Why does Marx talk so little about unfree labor? I mean, I'm not just talking about slavery, but I'm talking about, you know... Uh, you know, the poor house. He talks about the poor house, but he doesn't uh, uh, theorize it. And um, I mean, my, my intuition is that uh, um, it was so easy to critique capitalism from the point of view of slavery or unfree labor that he wanted to go as far as he could in the critique of liberalism, the critique of the pretension to freedom. I mean, that's my intuition. Um, but I think it's really important to see that legal f freedom, freedom of contract, private contract, and the right to impose non-contractual obligations have always gone together in the history of liberalism. And that liberals have always been, economic liberals at some point are always ready to accept um, the need for some kind of imposition of forced labor or forced kinship relationships. So for me, do you have questions? For me, the question. <laughs>
wieder nochmal vielen, vielen Dank an Melinda, an Felicita und an euch alle.